Welcome everyone. This is the COVID-19 and Emerging Infectious Diseases track. This is um, this session is COVID-19 basics, epidemiology, pathology, diagnosis, and treatment. Our presenters are Dr. Mara and Whitney Essex. Um, Dr. Mara is a director of infectious diseases for Cherokee Nation Health Services. Um, his work has focused on the CNHS response to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as directing uh, the CNHS HCV elimination program and the CNHS in the Ep HIV epidemic program. Dr. Mara, Dr. Mara is a board certified in infectious diseases by the American Board of Internal Medicine. And I'm not going to go over Whitney's presentation or bio because she's not, <laughs> she's not presenting. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Dr. Mara? Good morning. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and first, I want to uh, thank uh, Brian and Harry Brown and the rest of the organizers for inviting uh, to this meeting. And as um, Brian mentioned, I will be covering the subjects that are on the first uh, slide. Um, I will not, uh, I have chosen what I think would be uh, the most relevant uh, information under each topic. You know, we have had COVID for a year and a half now in the United States. Uh, and there's a lot of information out there uh, every day. Uh, it seems to be increasing which is good, uh, but uh, you know, I have tried to, in this presentation, give you what I think at least is the most important and relevant uh, for the clinician and for the uh, allied healthcare workers uh, uh, working in the subject. So as um, I might add the, the outline of my presentation, I'm, I'm gonna start with a little bit of virology and epidemiology. Uh, then I'll go into uh, the basics of diagnosis of uh, COVID-19, clinical presentation and risk factors for progression. I'll talk uh, uh, the, about treatment, the less, latest updated guidelines, uh, and then we'll cover post-COVID-19 in a little bit more uh, depth because that's what we're going to be left with after this pandemic is over and just a, a few main, uh, basic concepts on prevention. I will not be talking about vaccines because there's a specific presenter that's been invited for that topic. Uh, but if there's any questions, uh, you know, at the end, uh, if I can answer them, I, I will be happy to do so. Okay, a little bit about uh, virology. So um, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus that has a spike-like uh, surface protein like most coronaviruses or many of the coronaviruses. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page with the terminology, uh, the, component, the SARS acronym is for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The COV is for coronavirus. Um, and the number two is because this is the second uh, pandemic coronavirus that, uh, that uh, we have. Uh, the, we had a previous one in 2002 in China uh, that um, did not you know, go very far, but it was definitely uh, an, uh, an outbreak of concern. We, this is not the first time that we deal with coronavirus and, and human infections. You can see on the right upper hand here, we have four coronaviruses that are named with letters and numbers. And these are the ones that circulate every year in our communities, summer seasonal, uh, and they are responsible for about 15 to 20 percent of the cold uh, uh, infections, the common cold infections. And it is not rare that sometimes we may uh, even uh, admit a patient to the hospital with one of these viruses. But the, the magnitude and the severity uh, have nothing to do with um, COVID-19. And then uh, and the, the first uh, SARS-CoV virus, as I mentioned, was in China in 2002. Then we have the Middle Eastern respiratory um, uh, coronavirus and the Arabian Peninsula in 2012, with also a limited outbreak, but pretty high mortality. And finally, we're here today with SARS-CoV-2 that started in 2019 in China. So the virus is called SARS-CoV-2. The disease is COVID-19, which stands for coronavirus disease discovered in 2019, and that's why the number goes at the end of the, the acronym. So 
as if you are listening to the news, uh, you know, there's a heated debate or of where did this infection come from? Was it a laboratory virus? Was it a man-made virus? What is it? Is it? Was this a natural infection from a virus that jumped from animals to host? And, uh, you know, the final word is still not out there. What seems pretty uh, factual is that this prob virus probably started in bats that could have infected humans directly or uh, intermediate hosts like the pangolin in China, and then the pangolin infects the humans. Um, and that's that part is pretty well known. What is really not known, if this was an accidental escape of a virus from a laboratory that was doing research on the virus, but it seems that it was not a biological weapon uh, designed to be a biological weapon. You know, best case scenario, it came from animals directly to humans. Worst case scenario, it escaped from a lab on an accident, uh, but we will find out more as, uh, as time goes by. For us today, it really doesn't matter. I mean, we still have to deal with it uh, either way. So here uh, in this uh, slide on the left-hand side, uh, it's the pathogenesis of the virus. So the virus has the, uh, these spikes ca called the spike protein, among other things. And um, for the virus to infect any cell, uh, it's very important that the cell has an ACE2 receptor, which most cells of our human body uh, have. Mainly they're concentrated in the nasopharyngeal area and the alveoli of our lungs, but you can also find ACE2 receptors in the digestive tract and the heart and in many other uh, you know, organs. Now the virus, uh, and needs several other things to bind to that receptor. And it, it, it needs a molecule that's usually on the surface of, of uh, cell membranes called heparin sulfate. And it also needs this uh, protein in green here on, on the cell surface called TMPRSS2, which is a transmembrane protease. It's an enzyme. And all these three are needed for the virus to be able to internalize in the cell and start viral replication and, and you know, finally uh, destroying the cell. And the importance of knowing all these things, for us clinically today, not a big deal, but in research, there's a lot of drugs that are being uh, tested and synthesized in the lab to see if they can block any of these receptors or co-receptors or the heparin sulfate to see if it could be used therapeutically in the future. On the right-hand side, there's a, a, a cartoon of an adult and a child. And as you well know, um, this virus does not respect any age, but it's much more frequent in adults and it's much more severe in adults compared to children. Not saying that children cannot get really sick because they can, but when you look at the proportion of children being severely ill compared to adults, it's much less. So this uh, graph, uh, this cartoon tries to explain why could made this be the, the reason. So for one thing, adults have a lot of more uh, ACE2 receptors and their nasopharynx in their lungs than uh, children do. So that would be one explanation of why they ha adults have higher viral loads and higher viral replication. The other is that, uh, the other factor is that children also have less transmembrane protease S2 uh, enzymes compared to adults. And that, as I mentioned, that enzyme is very important in internalizing the virus in the cell. Uh, also, regarding the immune response, because these first two factors could explain maybe the proportion of children infected when exposed and the viral load that they may have, but it doesn't explain the severity of the illness necessarily. But it is known that adults have a predominantly IL-6 response, interleukin-6 uh, response, which is a very, it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. And that response, uh, it's not well developed in children. They have other uh, interleukins that predominate, which are less pro-inflammatory. So in summary, adults may have more receptors, more uh, enzymes as co-receptors or cofactors needed for infection. And the uh, immune response in adults is, is a little bit more severe, the inflammatory response. And this could be the explanation why uh, adults have more uh, frequent and severe infections than children. Uh, do. So let's stop a little bit and talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2 transmission because this has been uh, subject to a lot of debate since the pandemic started. And I remember when this happened originally, we were all pretty convinced based on the literature 
that uh, aerosol was not uh, a, 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 an important mode of transmission of this virus. We thought it was mainly droplets. And as time went by, we started understanding a little bit better that depending on the circumstances, aerosols could be an important factor of transmission. And maybe today are the most important factor, especially in the indoor setting. So uh, SARS-CoV-2 is transported by respiratory droplets, but respiratory droplets have a a uh, great variety of sizes. They can go from small microns to millimeters in size. And in the cartoon here, you can see that depicted on the big you know, drops, droplets and then the little pinpoint little ones. The big droplets, they do not travel uh, more than six feet. And these big droplets are usually generated when we cough or when we sneeze or when, or when we talk loud, et cetera. Uh, but the little droplets, the ones that are microns in size, um, they are uh, usually aerosols and um, they can be generated and they usually come more from your lung than your nasal pharynx. Um, and they can travel uh, many feet, not only six feet. They can be suspended in the air for hours, uh, depending on the, on the atmospheric conditions uh, and up to about 60 feet away from the person who is uh, infectious and you know, em emitting these droplets. So it came to light that the distinction between the large drop and the airborne transmission is a little bit nebulous, given that there's a continuum of sizes of emitted droplets on each individual. So today we do know that uh, there are several modes of transmission. First, inhalation of large droplets that are inhaled or auto inoculated. And that applies when you're like six feet away from someone, within six feet, that person's talking or coughing or sneezing and you don't have protection, you don't have a mask. So masks do protect you from droplets very efficiently. Um, then you can have uh, aerosols that are a short, uh, that travel a short distance and aerosols that travel a long distance. And the uh, inhalation of those large range airborne aerosols have become an important way of transmission, especially when you are indoors in a poorly ventilated space and people are not wearing masks. And there's a lot of people there uh, in that space. We know now that although it is possible to get infected through touching contaminated, contaminated surfaces and auto inoculating yourself, this is probably not the most efficient way of transmission, although it can occur and you know, hand washing uh, and you know, cleaning the surfaces of your work area is still important. Now there are some uh, factors that increase transmission risk and that are listed below in this, uh, in this table here. So if you sing, uh, transmission is more, much more frequently uh, the amount of aerosols you produce compared to when you're talking. If you're exercising and heavily breathing, same thing. If the, the time that you're exposed, it's not the same thing to go into, let's say, a bus and be there for 10 minutes or 15 minutes than go into a, a, a choir practice and be there for two hours in, in an a, you know, enclosed room without good ventilation. And not wearing a mask is critical. So on the right-hand side, you see these two graphs. The graphs are exactly the same, just that the bottom one is logarithmic and the top one is not. But you can see that of all uh, these activities, the, the, the higher the, the, the line on the graph, the more risk of generating large volume of aerosols. So singing is the greatest risk of generating large volumes of aerosols. But if you sing softly, it decreases the risk. If you speak, it's a little bit less risky. If you whisper, even less risky. If you're just mouth breathing, less risk than the above. And if you're nose breathing, that is, that's the smallest risk. So if you go into a room where there's a lot of people, just tell everybody to shut up and breathe through your noses and you probably will be safe for a little while. But the most important thing is to wear a mask because that prolongs the, the protection in that non-ventilated or poorly ventilated room. But the type of mask also matters. And we'll see this at the end of the presentation. N95s are better than surgical and surgical are better than uh, cloth masks. But they all work for a certain amount of time. The other important thing to understand in transmission is that one third of the patients who are infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 never develop symptoms. So that's the importance of you know, systematic mask use when you're in, in an indoor situation because you don't know the healthy looking individual that's sitting by you if he has COVID-19 or not. Uh, and there's studies that they have tested uh, individuals 
And if the individuals are asymptomatic, 75% of those asymptomatic individuals who test positive will remain asymptomatic. And the other important factor is that almost 60% or 59% of SARS-CoV-2 infection result from transmission from an asymptomatic individual. 35% of that 59% is from pre-symptomatic individuals, meaning that they were asymptomatic when you met them, but a few days later they got sick. And 24% from individuals who never got sick, they never developed symptoms. So that's why this is such a tricky infection because you get infected usually from people who are not manifesting any symptoms whatsoever. And that's why, you know, mask use uh, is, is so important. So the six foot rule that we had it as almost a, a, a biblical guideline when we, I'm sorry, when we started uh, the pandemic, it still works for the big droplets. And when you're within, you know, six feet from someone for 15 minutes, but that six foot rule does not apply when you're indoors. And I mean, does not apply as a protection, not because you're eight feet away from someone. If you're in an indoor situation that's poorly ventilated, you're not safer from airborne pathogens at 60 feet than at six feet. What can make you safer is wearing a mask and not and spending the least time possible in that uh, uh, enclosed non ventilated area. But what I tell you know a lot of colleagues that ask me or or, or not healthcare workers, hey, we want to do this meeting in this place. Is it safe? And you know you can go to the website that's on the reference of this slide, and there's a really cool calculator that you can plug in. Okay, I'm going to be in a room that's this size, and you plug in the size and there's going to be so many people in there and we're going to be there for so many hours and we will be doing this activity and it gives, gives you the option of putting you're going to be singing or you're going to be just talking or you know whatever you're going to be doing or exercising like in a gym and then that calculator tells you for how many hours is it safe for you to be there and also depending on what type of mask you're using so if you we really want to be scientific and that's what we should do today you know, we don't need to do lockdowns or, or uh, necessarily. We can just use the science to be prepared to be safe in the activities that we do. So after this few slides that I hope uh, you have learned or reinforced some of your concepts, uh, which of these two schools uh, would you uh, choose for your child? The one on the left or the one on the right? You don't have to answer now. This is just some uh, food for thought. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about variants. So originally when the pandemic started in Wuhan, we had uh, one type of virus that quickly in the next few months, it mutated to the one that we predominantly had until December of 2020. But after that, all these variants started uh, to uh, occur and variants are just that the virus mutates and the better fit virus is the one that predominates. These variants seem to spread more easily and quickly. And the concern is that they may lead to more cases of COVID, more hospitalizations because you have more cases and potentially more deaths. And as we are living today, I've been talking to colleagues across the country, many of us are a little bit um, uh, you know, overwhelmed uh, with uh, our, our, our healthcare systems, our, our, a bit overwhelmed with oh, so many patients being admitted. Now, so far, studies suggest that the current vaccines work on circulating variants, and the person who talks about a vaccine will give you more information. They definitely work on preventing morbidity and mortality, but they may be a little bit effective in preventing symptomatic infection compared to the previous variants that we had. The variants are classified as variants of interest. They're just interesting. They're not causing much problem. Then you see them, you know, little. Uh, different scenarios, but they're not a big problem. Variants of concern is with them when you have more, you know, defined outbreaks and they're more spread. And these are the four that are listed in CDC. First one was the one from the UK. The second one was the one from South Africa. The P1 was from originated in Brazil. And the last one, the one that's causing our problems today is the one that was uh, originally identified in India. Uh, and then we have variants of high consequence, which thank God we don't have any yet, because this would be like your Godzilla variant. It would be a variant that's globally spread, uh, vaccines don't work, monoclonals don't work, there's no antivirals, there's nothing we can do about it. We're not there yet, we're uh, only on variants of concern. 
So in the United States, and I, I updated this uh, yesterday from the CDC website, uh, but it's a graph uh, updated from the CDC updated on 821. And you can see here we're in May and now we're in August. And you can see the variants that we had in May. The UK variant was the predominant one in blue. And as time went by, uh, the, uh, the Delta variant started sub substituting uh, all these, the other ones. And right now, 97% of the variants circulating in the United States is Delta variant. And on the right hand side, you can see that across the country, it's the same variant. You know, before we would see in different regions, di different variants predominating, but right now it's all, all Delta variant. So what does this Delta variant mean? So this Delta variant has the properties of being twice as infectious as the previous, uh, as the UK strain that we had before and the other and the original variant before that. So it's more infectious. That is coming out that it, it may cause more severe illness, but the final word is still not out there. Uh, and there's two studies, one in Canada and Scotland, that have shown that it was that it had caused more hospitalizations compared to the alpha variant um, or the original virus strain. Unvaccinated people remain the greatest concern because most of the infections, not all, but most of the infections are, are happening in vaccinated individuals. And from my uh, local experience, more than 95% of our hospitalizations right now are caused by a, a Delta variant in unvaccinated individuals. Fully vaccinated people can get infected, but they, will, they have less chances of getting sicker or being hospitalized. And the other important thing that although the viral load may be the same in vaccinated versus unvaccinated, initially, as time goes by, it seems that, un, that vaccinated individuals can uh, decrease their viral load faster and therefore would be less contagious over time compared to non-vaccinated individuals. So here the message is very simple. You need to get vaccinated to uh, mitigate this variant from spreading any further. Let's go a little bit to talk, to talk about diagnosis. So um, this graph on the left, on the x-axis, you will see uh, weeks uh, divided by this dashed uh, vertical line or dotted line uh, on weeks before symptom onset of COVID-19 and weeks after symptom onset. The gray line is the uh, PCR sensitivity and the orange line is antigen sensitivity or probability of detection of the virus by using antigen or using PCR. So you can see that both of them peak more or less at the time of, of symptom onset, and then they rapidly decline. The antigen declines much more faster. So you may detect PCR many weeks after the original infection, but you rarely will detect antigen more than one week after the infection. Uh, PCR is more sensitive and, and spikes earlier than antigen, um, but they're, bo they're, they're both very specific. So, uh, nucleate acid amplification is still the gold standard and the recommended one to diagnose someone who's symptomatic. Uh, but the sensitivity of the test will depend on the timing, like any test in, this, in, the, in COVID-19. So timing is very important. And also the type of sample, is it a nasopharyngeal, is it a nasal, is it a sputum, is it stool, depending on where you're, where you're testing the virus. Nasal pharyngeal is a little bit more sensitive than nasal. Antigens, or have the capacity of being fast. You can get an antigen report in 15 or 20 minutes and they're more accessible and they're cheaper, uh, but they're a little bit less sensitive. So both have a role and we can discuss that uh, at the end and if there's any questions. But uh, I would say that if you have PCR capacity to diagnose the virus with rapidly or uh, nucleic acid amplification, that's the test that we use. If you don't have that to diagnose individuals uh, and, you know, within 20 minutes or one hour, antigen is an option, but just know that it's a little bit less sensitive. Uh, the bottom line that the sensitivity is higher if the test is performed on symptomatic patients uh, compared to asymptomatic patients. The PCR is the most sensitive, and there's other nucleic acid amplification tests that are not strictly laboratory-based PCRs, for example, ID now that are a little bit less sensitive than your standard PCR, but are better than antigen, and then you have antigen. Uh, in symptomatic and uh, asymptomatic patients, 
when you have a positive antigen, that confirms the infection. You don't need any confirmatory test for the most part. But if the test is negative, it does not exclude the infection. Usually compared to PCR, antigens are about 80% sensitive uh, in patients who are symptomatic and about 60% sensitive in patients who are asymptomatic. So both tests have a role and a place, but you just really need to know uh, what you expect from each test to make your clinical decisions. Clinical presentation. So it's very uh, heterogeneous. Um, the incubation period goes from two to 14 days. Uh, and after that, the patient, uh, you know, remember that one third will never develop symptoms and the other two thirds uh, will have some symptoms. And I'll go over those symptoms and give you my experience so far. So runny nose is very common, but it's not very specific. You can have people with allergies with runny nose and it doesn't help you differentiate much. Loss of taste and smell is pretty suggestive of COVID-19. It's not 100% specific, but nowadays I would say if anybody shows up with this, the first thing I think is COVID-19. And that's present maybe in about, depending on the series that you read, about 15 to 30%. In my experience, it's present in about 30% of the individuals that at least that we see sick enough to come to uh, consoles for their disease. Headache, especially frontal headache, is pretty prevalent in COVID-19. Cough is pretty prevalent. Uh, sore throat is hit or miss. Shortness of breath, that's a symptom that we see more frequently with COVID than with any other viral diseases. Usually when we were dealing with patients with influenza, if they were short of breath, that was a bad sign. These patients were progressing to a bad pneumonia. Here, most of our patients have shortness of breath and that doesn't mean that they're gonna have a bad outcome. Nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea are pretty common, sometimes more in kids. And one symptom that it's not only frequent, but it, it's the one that prolongs in time, even after the patient is over the acute phase, is fatigue. So what is going to happen with your patients? When you see a patient, what can you tell them of their outcome? And of course, their outcome will depend on many factors that we'll look into a few minutes, but 80% or 81% will do well, meaning they'll recover spontaneously without any specific treatment but 19% will end up in the hospital, 14% in the med surge unit, and 5% will end up in the ICU and be critically ill. Uh, so that's overall what you can tell the patient. Now, if they're young and healthy, probably they'll be more in the 81% range and, and, they'll, and their percentage will be better. If they're 85 years old, those are the ones that are worrisome. So why do some people have uh, good outcomes and some people have really bad outcomes? And we don't know that yet for sure, but there are several factors that we're learning. So the viral load has uh, something to do with it. People who had higher viral loads or more virus in the respiratory tract when they start with symptoms tend to do worse than the ones that have a low viral uh, on their respiratory tract. Unfortunately, there's not a, still a standard way of measuring this. Um, then it's your immune response. So for example, in this individual with a low virus titer activates their immune system and the cytokine response is, you know, uh, moderate and especially there's a and type one interferon response. Those patients tend to do well, but if the viral load is high and the cytokine response is excessive, what we call the cytokine storm, and uh, the interferon one uh, immune reaction is delayed or limited. Those are the patients that will evolve to uh, severe disease with lung injury, septic shock, uh, you know, organ failure, et cetera, and will not do well. So what are the risk factors for progressing to severe disease? Age and comorbidities. And age is the, the most important one. Here, I, I wanna show you if you are less than uh, 18 years of age, and this is risk of, of cases, hospitalization and death compared to 18 to 21 year olds. So this is your comparison group. We're comparing everything to this group. If you're less than 18 years old, your risk of all these factors are, are less than if you're 18 to 29 years old. But if you are, let's go to the extreme, 85 years old, you have 600 uh, times more of chances of dying compared to an 18 to 29 year old. And you can see that uh, the risk of dying is very progressive and increases with age and also the risk of hospitalization. So age is the main major uh, driver. Then if you go to the CDC website, you'll find a, a, a big list of diseases that can put you at higher risk of progression. 
And I would say that probably obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease are the, the main ones. Really, there's a lot of risk on, on many other ones, including pregnancy, for example. So uh, ethnicity is also important. You can see, and this is a CDC uh, slide uh, that looked at uh, risk of hospitalization and, and, uh, and death compared to uh, different ethnic groups compared to white population. And Native Americans have, have the highest hospitalization rates and the highest death rates compared to whites and actually compared to African-Americans or Hispano, Hispanic also. Now, I have to say that we don't know if this is a surrogate marker for other conditions, like they have other comorbidities, or is there a true predisposition because you're native that you will have a, a higher risk uh, of uh, getting sick or dying from COVID. So treatment, I'm going to briefly go through this, but try to give you what I think are the most important points. I uh, made this slide going through different stages of the disease. First stage is you don't have any disease, but you maybe have a high risk exposure um, uh, or, or you may be at risk for exposure. For example, you're an immune compromised individual or you live in a nursing home in which there's no COVID activity yet, but there could be. So pre-exposure prophylaxis is being looked at, but there's still nothing improved. So we don't have anything to offer there. Post-exposure prophylaxis, we do have monoclonal antibodies, and I'll give you a little bit more information on, on my next slide. So that means that you were exposed to COVID-19, you don't have symptoms, uh, can you do anything about it? And we have a treatment option or a prevention option. Then let's say you, you have COVID, you're symptomatic, but you do not require to be in the hospital and your pulse ox is greater than 94%, meaning you're breathing well, you're, you're oxygenating your blood properly, we do have monoclonal antibodies and we have two types of them to give you to decrease your risk of hospitalization. Then I'll, I'll skip the gray zone. The gray zone is not part of the guidelines. That's my personal input to this problem. Then you jump to symptomatic patients in which they're not ox oxygenating well. Their pulse ox is less than 94%. They probably require to get to be hospitalized. Then we have antivirals and immune modulatory agents like steroids, tocilizumab, uh, or baricitinib, et cetera. And then we have treatment of other complications associated with COVID, which is thromboembolic disease and bacterial and fungal co-infections. But there's a gray zone here that we've noticed, and it's also been published uh, in a few articles, in which patients come and their, their pulse ox at rest is 94%, but they talk or move and it really drops. So we're not sure if they're too late for the monoclonal or too early for the remdesivir. And this is a tough one, a tough call. I'll leave it there and we can discuss it at the end if anybody's interested on what do we do with these patients. So as I mentioned, there's a post-exposure prophylaxis EUA, emergency use authorization, using monoclonal called casirivimab and endevimab uh, for people who are at high risk for progression of COVID-19. So the key here is that you have to have been exposed, you have to be at high risk of progression, meaning by age or comorbidities, and uh, and you do not have to have full vaccination. So two, two conditions, you shouldn't be vaccinated or you could be vaccinated, but you, the, you think that that patient will not have not had, has a high chance of not responding to the vaccine. Let's say a transplant recipient or a severe immune compromised individual could still include those. And you have to have an exposure to SARS-CoV-2 defined by CDC, you know, 15 minutes within six feet, et cetera. And, and if you meet all that category, you're a candidate to get the monoclonal, which is either SEPQ or IV. And the beauty is that the studies have shown that you have 62% less chances of developing symptomatic COVID if you get the monoclonal versus if you got placebo in the studies. Don't be afraid. This is a kind of very confusing with a lot of information, but there's one, well, there's really one or two things you need to know. So, so these are the NIH COVID-19 guidelines for non-hospitalized patients. So the bottom line is that if you do not require hospitalization, basically you're in this category right here, symptomatic, pulse ox is fine, don't need to be hospitalized, it's monoclonal antibodies, either uh, casirivimab, endevimab, which is the regen cove, or sotrovimab, those are your two options. And by getting this, these and monoclonals early enough in the disease, you decrease your risk of hospitalization, emergency uh, visits, and death. 
And the other important thing to know that if you're being discharged from the ED, and this is happening now because we don't have enough hospital beds out in the, in the country, you go to the ED, you're a little bit hypoxic, but not that sick, and they send you home on oxygen, you can also add dexamethasone to those patients and, and make sure they, they're not hospitalized because we don't have enough beds, not because they would need to be hospitalized, but you can keep them home safely, probably with good monitoring and dexamethasone. And then for hospitalized individuals, these are the guidelines on the left that you can review at you know, your leisure. But to make it simple, if you end up in the hospital with COVID-19 and do not need oxygen, and I'm wondering why would you be in the hospital in the first place? Well, you could be there for appendicitis for, for all we know, or for another condition, and you happen to have COVID, then a monoclonal will still be a, a good choice of uh, cacerivimab or sotrovimab. If you're requiring oxygen, but not a lot of oxygen, remdesivir and dexamethasone is your choice of treatment. If you require more oxygen, it's the same combination, but the only thing is that dexamethasone is probably more important and has better indications than remdesivir. If you continue to progress within three days of admission, despite getting dexamethasone and remdesivir, which is an antiviral, then you could add uh, an IL-6 inhibitor, tocilizumab, or a JAK2 inhibitor, bericitinib, to the combination. Tocilizumab is IV, bericitinib is PO. Now, if you're really sick and you're requiring uh, invasive mechanical ventilation or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, then you should get dexamethasone and tocilizumab on day one. Now, you can see that remdesivir is not listed here because actually it hasn't been proven to be helpful in this group, but you will see that most patients are getting it anyways because uh, when you're at this stage, everybody wants to treat you the best as best as they can, although the evidence does not support remdesivir in that group. This is the same slide, uh, kind of putting everything together. Initially, when you're having the, the viral response phase without hypoxia, it's monoclonals. When you start getting a little bit sicker and get hypoxemic, remdesivir and dexamethasone play a role. And when if you get sicker, then you add the other two immune modulators. Children, I'll just say two words real quick. Uh, they usually have mild and more mild infections than adults. Uh, the majority will not require any specific therapy. We don't have as much research in children as we have in adults. And the majority of the treatments are extrapolated from the data we know in adults. So hopefully we'll get more information uh, in the near future. And this is the definition of the multisystemic inflammatory syndrome. I'm not gonna go into details, I'll leave the definition there for you. But the bottom line is that you have to have a systemic inflammation, more than two organs involved, and you have to exclude any other disease that could be causing this. And if you do, you meet this criteria. So treatment for children, like I said, mostly extrapolated for, from adults, but if a child is hospitalized, there is a role for remdesivir in some groups, there is a role for dexamethasone, and individuals who have the systemic inflammatory syndrome you should consult a specialist because the treatment gets a little bit more complicated and we have less data than we would like to at this moment. So post-COVID-19, um, I think this is gonna be very important because this is gonna be what we're left with after this pandemic is gone, uh, which I don't know when that will happen either. Um, so after you develop COVID, you go through an acute phase which takes uh, you know, a week or two, but after week four, you're in the subacute or ongoing COVID. And then after week 12, it's when people define you have uh, post-COVID or chronic COVID or long COVID, and there's a lot of terminology for it. The problem is that you see patients showing up with fatigue, with shortness of breath or cough, with anxiety, sleep disturbances, heart symptoms, clotting events, kidney problems, and hair loss, which is not, life-threatening, but it's very worrisome. Um, and so what do we do with these patients? Well, what, what can we offer them and what's really going on? So first, let's define terminology. Acute COVID is when you have COVID, symptoms of acute COVID, the ones we've described, up to four weeks following the acute onset of illness. After four weeks, if you're still symptomatic, that's called ongoing COVID. But after 12 weeks, if you have symptoms or symptoms appear, that you cannot explain by anything else, that's called post-COVID-19. 
So the origin of these symptoms is a, a little bit different. Uh, on res, uh, you know, if you ended up in the ICU originally and had bad ARDS, uh, your post-COVID syndromes are gonna be due to the destruction of that lung or that kidney or heart problems. So it's kind of easy to explain. Same thing that happens in any other acute severe illness. But then you have complications of COVID that could happen, like you can have a pulmonary embolism, or you can have um, you know, the loss in taste and smell that can last for weeks or months. But then there's a lot of symptoms that we don't have a good way of explaining it because COVID is gone, there's nothing else going on, there was no obvious destruction of anything, and patients have fatigue or shortness of breath and, or a neuropsychiatric psychiatric symptoms that we cannot explain. The most, my advice is make sure in the, in the uh, ongoing COVID or post-acute COVID or even at the end of the acute COVID, that you do not miss organizing pneumonia, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary uh, thromboembolism, pulmonary heart palpitation, or bacterial and fungal infections, because these are all, for the most part, uh, except for pulmonary fibrosis, they're all treatable, and that can change the outcome of your patient's life. And usually the, te the test that you need to categorize these uh, entities is a chest CT, pulmonary function test, an EKG and an echocardiogram. And that can also all be done even in an outlying clinic. For patients that we're seeing after the 12 weeks, uh, fatigue is very common. What we do is just make sure they don't have any thyroid abnormalities. It's not a, uh, an expression of congestive heart failure. We order a BNP. Many patients actually have obstructive sleep apnea they had before COVID and nobody diagnosed. And now you're, you know, they're coming to life. So sleep, we are ordering a lot of sleep studies and make sure they don't have any myopathies and consider physical therapy if nothing is found. For shortness of breath, you need to rule out the entities that I showed you on the previous slide, make sure they don't have a PE, a pneumonia, a bacterial fungal, et cetera. And I've listed the basic workup that we do to evaluate that. Depression and anxiety is very common. There's, I think you have to evaluate it the same way you would any other patient with depression and anxiety. Uh, there's no specific guidance right now. Do not perform autoimmune workup without a clinical diagnosis in mind, or else you'll have a lot of tests that you don't know how to interpret. Um, many, things that are, many things that are really happening is that patients have, you're diagnosing conditions the patient had before COVID, and now they're coming to light, and you're having to deal with them, and the patient also has to deal with them. And the most important thing I would say is support the patient in this journey. Tell them the things we know, the things that we don't know but that you, you will be there for them and see them as, as, frequently, as frequently as they need to be seen. And that usually helps uh, uh, carry this um, part of their COVID life uh, very successfully until these symptoms go away. And finally, for prevention, I only have one slide. Vaccination is the most important tool we have for prevention. That's all I'm gonna say because there's a specific lecture on vaccination. Wearing masks, and cloth face coverings is extremely important, uh, especially when you're in the indoor setting. I am surprised that I still go to supermarkets and I'm the only one with the mask on. Um, and it's important to know that not all masks are created equal. So cloth masks are better than no mask, surgical masks are better than cloth masks, and N95s are better than uh, surgical masks. And I don't think we have a shortage of any today in this country that anybody can actually choose the one that they prefer or they feel more comfortable with. Maintaining the six feet distance, it is helpful, but remember if you're in an indoor portally ventilated setting, that's not gonna cut it. The mask will help you a little bit more. Avoid crowds and congregate settings. Outdoors a lot better than indoors and frequent hand washing uh, to eliminate all sources of transmission. And I'll leave you with this uh, slide that I'll read it in case someone uh, cannot read this slide. I told him as an expert in the field, I strongly recommend wearing it, but he just keeps bringing up his rights. And I think that's what we're living all today with this uh, pandemic. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mayor. If there's any questions, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand or type in the chat box and we can uh, answer your questions. Thanks, Brian. Um, I had a uh, couple of comments and a uh, couple of questions as well. 
Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to say that um, I expected that this talk would be the best summary of COVID that I've ever heard, and I was not disappointed. Thank you, Dr. Mira, for um, a really, really excellent talk. Um, I'm glad it was recorded because I plan to uh, encourage lots and lots of people to watch it. Um, so I, 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 I did have a few questions. Um, one is, uh, <laughs> please, please don't um, yell at me or, I, well, I know you wouldn't do that, but um, ivermectin, this is uh, something that's being touted by a lot of uh, people for both prevention, and I think that was based on one study, uh, but also for treatment. Um, and, you know, months ago, we didn't know. We didn't know if it was any good or, you know, could be harmful in, or anything. But I, I just wondered, um, what, what is your view on ivermectin? Oh, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you, Harry. That's a, a, a great question. Actually, a very timely question, uh, because we are seeing, unfortunately, a lot of people overdosing on ivermectin. And uh, so I'll summarize it this way. Like you mentioned, when the pandemic started, there was some hope on ivermectin because it does have some mechanisms that it could uh, inhibit viral replication, especially SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, but what was found early is that the doses that you need of ivermectin to inhibit viral replication in vitro uh, are 10 times the ones that we use in humans for other indications like as an antiparasitic drug. So it would be too toxic to use the doses that we need to inhibit the virus. Nevertheless, you know, many drugs have properties that go beyond their antimicrobial activity, uh, like they could be immune modulators and, you know, and help you. So a lot of studies were started and carried underway. Many of the studies, unfortunately, were not well designed, but the few that were, and I've read at least for two of them, which are uh, double-blind, randomized, control studies with a placebo arm, both of these studies have not proven any benefit uh, with ivermectin. And of course, the doses that were used were the human acceptable doses, and, and that's why they didn't have any you know, mortality due to ivermectin. Although they had uh, one of those two studies had a little bit more side effects with ivermectin, but nothing serious. I think it was GI tract side effects, but it, there was no benefit. And but then you see some published uh, meta analysis that say you know it does decrease mortality and all that. But when you take a deep dive on the meta analysis, you now meta analysis depends on which studies you decide to incorporate in your meta analysis. If you incorporate all the wrong studies, then you're gonna have the wrong answer. Uh, but there's a, a good meta-analysis published in uh, Open Forum Infectious Diseases recently that was, a, you know, very carefully looked at uh, the best studies and it did not show any, any, any benefit with ivermectin. And unfortunately, people are desperate and not, are not guided by science. And instead of getting vaccinated, they wait until they get sick. And when they get sick, and instead of coming in to get a monoclonal, they go in the routes of ivermectin, but they're getting it at vet veterinary shops and the doses they're ingesting are toxic and we are seeing the consequences. So in short, I'm not saying that a year from now, there may be a study that shows that using it this way or this form may prove to be useful, but as of today, uh, it is not useful. And I, we have other useful medications that we can use. Okay, my um, second question is, uh, you mentioned the gray zone patient. Um, what, what is your approach to those patients? Right, so we're, you know, we're in the midst of trying to figure out what we do with these patients. And the scenario is the following, the patient shows up to our monoclonal antibody clinic because they tested positive for COVID, they're symptomatic. One of our nurses uh, you know, kind of screened them and said that you can come in and get the monoclonal, the casirivimab, uh, that's the one that we have in our, in our clinic. And they come in, and okay, they come in walking, right? Like everybody comes in walking to the cure clinic. They don't fly in. And when they're walking, they're exercising. And when they sit, the first pulse ox is like they're 88%. And we're saying, they're, they're, okay, they're not a candidate for this. But then, you know, they're there. We leave them, leave them five or 10 minutes. And then their sets come up and they're 95%, 96%. So at rest, they are good, but they deset really quickly if they move around the room or if they talk, et cetera. 
So the problem is that monoclonals should not be used if you don't have a good uh, saturation above 94 or 93%. Um, and remdesivir can, should be used when you're a little bit hypoxic. But what has happened is we've sent these patients to the ER originally, and when they get there, same deal. Their sats are fine and they get sent home. So it, it's like they're too early. They're too late for the monoclonal, but they're too early for the remdesivir. They're in that little gray zone. Now, there's been two studies. I think I've sent one of them to you recently, and if not, I will. Uh, one of the studies, they're, they're not exactly the situation I'm describing, but one of the studies looked at uh, uh, people with COVID-19 who have exercise desaturation. That's what I'm describing right now. And then what they found is that those people are at higher risk of progressing in the next few days to you know, the full-blown severe COVID, uh, requiring more oxygen, et cetera. So, and, and if you don't have the saturation at rest, you're probably gonna be good. You're not gonna, in general, you're not gonna progress. So my opinion, if I had the power, which I don't, would be that I would probably start those patients on remdesivir because I think that's the way they're gonna go uh, and not on the monoclonal and then watch them very carefully. And if they start desaturating uh, you know, at rest, then I, 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 I would jump with the dexamethasone. But right now we're trying to figure out what exactly what to do with them because they're not gonna get admitted if their pulse ox is normal at rest and they're not gonna get remdesivir as an outpatient. So it is a great, that's why I put it's a great area. I mean, we, we don't know what to do yet. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering if those patients might benefit from being hospitalized if you have the capacity. And given remdesivir, you know, I, I know that's probably an off-label use, but uh... no, no, that, that's a great, yeah, that's a great point. And, and yes, if, so what I would do in the ideal world, if I had the capacity, I would admit that patient and at least observe them for 24 hours, because on the studies that that have been done, they've noticed that when they go south, they go south quickly in, yeah. in the next 24 hours. So it is you would put them on observation. The problem that we're having right now is that we don't have the capacity to put a, a patient in, in a hospital with that. It's not gonna be requiring any specific treatment. Yeah. So what I'm recommending to the urgent care and the ED doctors is send the patient with a pulse oximeter home. And they have that. They bought a bunch of pulse oximeters. Tell them to measure their pulse ox at rest. And if it starts to dip, have them come back in because then we'll admit them. But I agree with you that probably if remdesivir works, at all because there's good data that it prolongs, uh, decreases length of hospitalization. There was a recent meta-analysis that it could even decrease mortality, but I mean, that's not hundred percent clear. It, it, if it works, it should work in that period better because the patient's like having active viral replication, starting to decide at exercise, but not at rest because they're not that sick yet. So if I could give it at home, which you can't, because there's no protocols for that or the FDA is not, the drug is not authorized for ambulatory use. Uh, that's what I would do. Okay, my last uh, question, and, and if, if other people have questions, I don't want to monopolize the question period, but um, early on when the recovery trial first came out of the UK saying that uh, dexamethasone was, uh, a great drug for people who were seriously ill with COVID. You know, it, it was shown to decrease mortality in people who were requiring oxygen or mechanical ventilation. Um, <clears throat> but that same trial uh, showed that people who were given dexamethasone who were not requiring oxygen, although it was not statistically significant, the trend was actually towards harm. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think a lot of people just sort of heard the press release that dexamethasone saves people from COVID. So what I saw months ago was some of our um, ER and outpatient providers here at uh, the Eastern Band of Cherokee were giving everybody that had a COVID diagnosis, they were sending them home with dexamethasone. So um, through our medical director, I sent out something saying basically, don't do that, it, you know, you could actually be harming. So I, I just wanted to ask you, well, first of all, confirm that that is still the case, right? We shouldn't be using dexamethasone in people who aren't that sick and not requiring hospitalization and uh, supplemental oxygen. 
Correct. That, that is correct. And you worded it very nicely. So, and, and that's a problem that I think we're all seeing and having everywhere that, you know, I know it's tough for a physician to see a patient that has a potentially very severe disease that at that moment, they're not that sick and they don't require to be hospitalized to send them home with nothing. Uh, but sometimes nothing is the best you can do for a patient. And right. uh, you know, the other mistake I'm seeing is first, may, many are being sent with dexamethasone that they could be harmful, as you all mentioned. Yes. The only exceptions would be the patient has COPD and they're having an exacerbation. Okay, you're doing it for the CP, COPD exacerbation, and that's fine. Right. They have right. asthma and you need to put steroids, but not for COVID. And the other thing is that we're seeing too many antibiotics being prescribed. And uh, initially, we didn't have a lot of information. But now we know that patients that do not require hospitalization, it would be extremely rare for them to have a co-infection with a bacterial uh, pneumonia um, at that stage. And so it is not advisable to send them home on antibiotics unless you have some clinical clue that there could be a, you know, a pneumococcal pneumonia on top of this. But just uh, as a standard of treatment, that's another problem we're facing is antibiotic use. Yeah, and what I've been telling providers who say, well, why can't you use dexamethasone? It might help. Um, what I've been saying, and, and please tell me if I'm wrong in this, early on in the course of the disease, what the patient is experiencing is high viral replication. Well, you don't really want to turn down the immune system with a steroid at that point, because you need the immune response to try to inhibit viral replication. Correct. Later in the course, when they're, they're really sick and they're requiring oxygen, it's not because of viral replication. That's already happened. Now it's because of the cytokine storm. And that's when you want to use dexamethasone to turn down the, the immune system. Um, is, is that, that may be an overly simplistic way of looking at it, but do you think that that's... No, it, it is correct. It's not overly simplistic. I mean, that is correct. And actually... You know, the other a gray zone for steroids that's coming out into light now is people who are over 70 years old. That subgroup seems not to be doing so well on dexamethasone either, but the final word is still not out. Mm. Uh, and, 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 you know, the uh, remdesivir is indicated for five days. Now they say when patients get worse and they, if they end up in the ICU, you can extend it to 10 days. I mean, there's no data that that increases, more, uh, decreases mortality. But we know, like you said, dexamethasone, there is data that when you use dexamethasone, the viral shedding is, is prolonged. So there's more viral replication when you are using the steroid. So definitely, yes, at the beginning, we need to shut down the viral replication, not the immune system. And at the end, it's the opposite, just like you said it. Uh, I agree with that statement. And that's what I tried to depict on that graph that I didn't have too much time to explain in detail, but your words come very nicely here is uh, when you see the the timing and, and of the viral replication, the immune response, and where the medications you know fit best. Thank but you. Yeah, thank you for those questions. Yeah. All right. So I work in a uh, public health office for the tribe. That's not what I normally do. I am a nurse, but I'm a grants provider for underage drinking. But uh, due to uh, spiking cases here and uh, some of the staff having to be quarantined due to exposure. We recently just had our, the public health officer himself come up positive. He's symptomatic, pretty, he's pretty down right now. He hasn't been hospitalized, he is at home. But uh, we did quarantine the entire office um, for, for a week. Everybody was asymptomatic the whole time. And post seven weeks, of, or not seven weeks, seven days of quarantine, we still remain negative and asymptomatic. Uh, but my question goes towards your monoclonal uh, antibodies. Uh, should that be something that he would, might want to think about incorporating uh, for exposure, especially to the staff that are at, at increased exposure? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, that is definitely an option uh, if you meet all the criteria. So you have to be, remember, not vaccinated uh, or, or be vaccinated, but have some medical conditions that you think, okay, maybe he did not respond very well to the vaccine like they're taking immune suppressive medication or steroids or they're a transplant recipient or, you know, whatever. Um, and that you have to have a defined exposure as you're, uh, and you probably do because you put them on quarantine, that means they had an exposure, uh, you know, more than 15 minutes within inside a room with someone who had COVID-19. 
and yes, the monoclonal would be an indication there. The reason we haven't started using it is because right now we can barely, we're barely at capacity to deliver the monoclonal for people who are sick. So we don't have enough capacity to start doing post-exposure prophylaxis because we, you know, we can deliver maybe 30 or 40 treatments. Actually, now it's going to be like almost 50 treatments a day. And we have 50 sick people that need the treatment. But if we had only 20 that needed the treatment, then we would have room to deliver to another 30 post-exposure prophylaxis. And I would certainly do that. Um, as long as you, you, know, you meet the criteria uh, that the EUA has authorized you to do it, but that's definitely an option. And you could do it sub-Q or you could do it IV. I, you know, I pref the, the study was done with sub-Q, that post-exposure prophylaxis study. We are just very used to doing it IV and we're more comfortable doing it that way than giving someone four shots because you still need to observe them for an hour. And the time the patient's gonna be there is two or three hours at the end of the day. Um, but yes, you have those two options. And I think uh, I would consider it in, in your situation. Unless they're all vaccinated and very healthy people, then they wouldn't meet criteria. Um, I'm healthy. Um, I'm not vaccinated and I don't intend to. My wife, uh, she just recently started working as an emergency hire with them. She had COVID last year. Now, she's unvaccinated as well. But um, basically, it's about within the uh, tribal community, not just their citizens, but uh, employees. It's about a, roughly about 50% that have gone and been vaccinated. And just to say that, you know, the public health officer, he's fully vaccinated. He was wearing an N95 respirator, full PPE <laughs> that whole day that we came back in. And um, even still, um, that's something we're seeing um, in that office where we discuss uh, about vaccinated versus unvaccinated and uh, being reinfected. Um, I've seen quite a few cases of vaccinated, asymptomatic, and then they just decided, you know, hey, we we're seeing some cases starting to rise. So they go and make all their citizens and they make all their employees get tested and half of them were, were, uh, were COVID positive and they remain un, uh, uh, asymptomatic. There's only been, you know, maybe one out of 20 cases is what I've seen so far that actually ended up being symptomatic. Right, so the vaccine has lost a little bit of protection for uh, infection. So, you know, we can still get infected, vaccinated. What it gives you really good protection is for severe disease. Uh, still, I mean, I don't know. I hope it lasts for, well, now we're going to go through a third dose. So maybe we'll, you know, bump up our immune system a little bit more. But it, it basically is good protection for, for severe illness. But you have to follow EUA guidelines. You know, when you do something or else, if something goes wrong and you're not following, you can get in trouble. 